Hello, I'm Michael Pierce, and this is The Human Condition. Today we're talking about tips and tricks for depression from a mental health perspective and from a natural biochemistry perspective. When an individual has depression, it's usually defined as a sadness or a loss of interest or a loss of motivation. And it can be mild, moderate, or severe. It can be long-lasting in some people. It can be intermittent in other people. And it can be confused for bipolar disorder, which is devastating when you're using medication. So be sure that you understand the difference between depression and the major depression component of bipolar disorder. Depression can be partly and massively hereditary. It can, it can be passed down in families. And there can be a trauma component to it or a PTSD component to it. There also can be a mild traumatic brain injury or post-concussion component to depression, where a person gets depression after they've had a concussion, a blow to the head, or even just a whiplash where they don't hit their head on anything. When we assess depression from a natural holistic perspective in alternative medicine, we don't just do a psychological assessment. We look at the biochemistry, and that means looking at the blood and looking at blood sugar and hypoglycemia. Hypoglycemia and thyroid disorders are one of the major problems that can masquerade as depression when a person has a problem such as anemia, a problem with thyroid disorder, or a problem such as uh, adrenal dysfunction, if they have difficulty with hypoglycemia, all of these difficulties can mimic depression and make a person act actually depressed, but they aren't fundamentally depressed if they're fed properly. So we need to do blood tests to look for anemia and to look at ferritin and iron. We need to look at red blood cells. We need to look at the blood sugar. We need to look at the fasting glucose and the hemoglobin A1c, and sometimes we need even to look at fructosamine, which is a, a, about a two-week indicator of blood sugar uh, activity. It's, it's a lot like hemoglobin A1c, except hemoglobin A1c is a, is a, a few months, uh, about three, four months of time, whereas fructosamine is about two weeks, 14 days. And, and blood sugar fasting is just that very day and night, the night before, if you fast for it. And you must fast for it. If you're not fasting, you don't have an accurate blood sugar number. So realize too that we can test the organic acids in the urine, which will test for metabolites or breakdown products of dopamine and serotonin and norepinephrine. Because when someone gets depression, it's not just serotonin. It's not just the need for serotonin in their brain. It's usually much more complex, and it involves a lot of other stuff that, that involves methylation pathways and things that a holistic doctor can test for and talk to you about and understand. The adrenal components are also a big deal because a person can have either overactive adrenals or underactive adrenals or both at the same time. And that's because the adrenals are not just on or off, high or low. The adrenals send a spurt or a burst of activity in the morning and then they settle down the rest of the day and night and then they spike again in the morning to help drive your blood sugar correctly so that you can wake up in, in the morning properly and with good energy. If you wake up tired or you wake up groggy or you have crazy cravings in the afternoon or you get hangry at 3 p.m., that type of thing is often blood sugar related and it's often related to, to adrenal imbalances. So the adrenals require some nutrients that are extremely important for depression. Otherwise, a person can be really, really flatlined and just not get better. Usually a person that's got depression from adrenal dysfunction has low firing adrenals and their, their adrenal uh, saliva or urine has flatlined. So when you test them, you'll find that they just don't have much output of cortisol and norepinephrine. And in, in that case, the person often needs vitamin B5, which is the, the major tonic for, for adrenal glands and helps them recover, as well as zinc and magnesium, which are so important for making the adrenal glands healthy. And then omega-3s, the, the adrenal glands and their chemicals require these uh, cholesterol-based molecules to be proper, such as omega-3s and EPA and DHA. So a person needs EPA and DHA, which are the fish oils. They're, they also occur in red meat if you have it grass-fed from very, very healthy grasses and very healthy animals. The, probably the, the greatest secret of all is niacinamide. Niacinamide works in both anxiety and depression, and it works both in overmethylation and in undermethylation, if you've heard me talk about that phenomenon. In biochemistry of the brain, there is this phenomenon called methylation cycles. And these methylation cycles are, are patterns in the brain where we convert one chemical to another, to another, to another in this daisy chain of events that happen. And those events require vitamins and minerals. And they can also have a problem of toxic metals. 
If you have toxic metal exposure, you can stop and mess up that particular process. The methylation cycle can be abruptly altered by factors like deficiencies of minerals and by excesses of toxic heavy metals and by deficiencies of the B vitamins. The methylation cycle can also be affected by SNPs. If a person has SNPs, the SNPs determine how this person's genes might be uh, actively upregulated or downregulated, and the ceilings or floors about which a person can make a certain amount of enzyme or, or produce the chemical that needs to be made on demand. Some people are just born with less of a capacity, like some of us can't jump and some of us can't run faster than others and some of us can't hold our breath as long and some of us can. Those things are determined in brain chemistry partly through the SNPs and partly through the organic acid test of urine organic acids. In a number of people with depression, they simply can't make enough serotonin and their doctor forgot to ask them, do you have the elements that are needed to make serotonin healthily? And they are very simple. You need iron, you need magnesium, you need L-tryptophan, and you need uh, good fats, as I talked about before. One of the biggest problems in depression is not necessarily always the, the serotonin problem, but it can be the dopamine problem, which is a person with depression may have anhedonia, which means a lack of pleasure, because they don't have enough dopamine as well. So they may need to boost their levels of dopamine, which comes from taking L-tyrosine, and of course iron and magnesium again to make that process happen, and B6 and B12 and folate and all those things that are required to make that. There is another phenomenon that happens in depression, which uh, happens among Americans, and it's a B6 deficiency. B6 is pyridoxine. B6 is something that you get in animal products and you can, you can get in fortified brewer's yeast. It's very important to get B6 because you can't have enough energy without B6. The problem with B6 is that a lot of people take a B50, which is a a hodgepodge of B vitamins, and they just mix them all together and the doses are way too high, and a person can feel really good for a couple of weeks and then they crash. So be aware that if you take a multi-B50 or a multivitamin without balancing the B vitamins for you, you might have a real problem. So overtaking B6 is, is often as much or more of a problem as undertaking B6. When a person gets uh, carpal tunnel syndrome, we, we see a phenomenon called carpal tunnel syndrome of pregnancy. This can happen with uh, pregnant women who get pregnant and they, they get carpal tunnel syndrome and, and other tunnel syndromes in their elbows and in their feet where, where nerves that go through tunnels or canals in bone get irritated. And that can happen from both a deficiency or an excess of B vitamins. Be careful to look for people that get double carpal tunnel syndrome. You may not need surgery, you may just need B vitamins or you may be overtaking your B vitamins. You wouldn't believe how many people I see take products and six of their products have B6 in them, or six of their products have B12 in them, and they wonder why they're you know, frantic and, and agitated. Uh, on the other hand, if you don't take enough, you really can be depressed and, and very, very, very fragile. Don't forget about thyroid disorders. We, we mentioned thyroid just a bit ago, and, and autoimmune thyroid is 90% of the thyroid disease that happens among humans. Almost 10% of the people in the United States have a thyroid disorder, and 10% of them are relatively simple everyday iodine deficiencies or simple thyroid disorders that are deficiencies of protein or, or iodine, but another 90% of them are autoimmune. That means Hashimoto's autoimmune thyroid. That means that the person's immune system has decided to attack their thyroid gland. That can be extremely important for people with depression and anxiety or bipolar disorder. So please be aware that you should have a thyroid test with a complete thyroid panel and not just a TSH test because that's not enough to tell you what's going on with your thyroid and with your immune system. And the really sad thing is in the United States, the medical system doesn't differentiate between a simple thyroid disorder and an autoimmune thyroid disorder. They treat them both the same by giving you thyroid hormone. Now, thyroid hormone is important if you have a, a truly deficient, medically deficient thyroid. You've got to have the hormone because your organs will, will, will degrade and fall apart without enough protein, without enough thyroid hormone in a very short time. So please be aware that it's important to take your thyroid hormone if it's been prescribed to you, but you've got to have a discussion with your doctor about, can I get off of this? Can I reduce this? Can I look at my immune system? How can I help my immune system calm down so it stops attacking my thyroid? And that's very important for us to work on. And in the medical profession, they'll simply give you steroids to stop your immune system from attacking your thyroid. And there's a lot of natural ways we can reduce that. We can reduce antigens, we can reduce lectins, we can reduce grains, and we can reduce glutens, and we can reduce dairy proteins, because these proteins are very similar in shape. It's called molecular mimicry. They're similar in shape to the thyroid glands. 
markers. So the thyroid gland has these tiny little markers on the surface that are molecularly similar to the lectins and to the protein and, and starch. They're called moieties, but protein and starch little fingers that stick out or name tags that stick out of the, of the surface of these foods and, and of these thyroid glands. And so if your immune system gets confused and mistakes one thing for another, it'll think that the immune system has to attack the thyroid gland because it mistakes that for basically an infectious organism. It says, I think I'm being infected and I have to fight the thyroid gland and I have to fight gluten and I have to fight dairy. And so you have an autoimmune attack against your food and your thyroid gland. You can reduce that with all kinds of natural methods and elimination diets. Let's look at some methods that are used to help the symptoms of depression. Lemon and ginger are very useful as aromatherapy. Grapefruit and holy basil are useful as aromatherapy. Holy basil itself as an herb supplement that's taken orally can be useful. When the adrenal glands are, are problematic, ashwagandha is very useful for helping the adrenal glands recover, and so is Siberian ginseng. Those are very useful for the adrenal glands, and you'll find that in some cases there are mild blood thinners. So you have to be aware of if, you're, if you have a clotting disorder or you take a blood thinner, you need to talk to your doctor about them. If you are an everyday person without medication and, and you notice that you get excessive nosebleeds, you might have to reduce your dose of ashwagandha or Siberian ginseng because that can happen to people and it's, it's common enough to, to watch out for in, in the high doses. So don't, don't just pile on these doses and ignore possible nosebleeds or other types of things. These are relatively harmless, but you'll notice that your, your nose might bleed more often than it used to, or it might bleed longer than it used to before it clots and stops bleeding. So be aware of that. I think that depression is extremely important to address with chiropractic and acupuncture. I think that acupuncture can normalize the qi and the jing, which I don't understand, but I love it. I'm very excited about it. And I, I think you need to talk to your, your uh, traditional Chinese medicine clinicians, of which I am not, and, and get some acupuncture. I get acupuncture. I think it's very important. Uh, chiropractic is extremely important because of the, the cerebrospinal fluid and the way that the, the atlas vertebra rides up on the condyles of the skull. Some people can have serious problems and other people have no problems. But, uh, but get a chiropractic examination of your neck and of your spine. And, and I often think that in depression, we see people with uneven legs. And it's a functional lesion, which means the, the legs are not truly short, skeletally. The bones are not short. It's just there's a draw up of one side of the spine, one side of the pelvis, that makes one leg appear shorter than the other when lying face down prone or, or supine face up. And so get a good chiropractor that can check your leg length and understand what it means and how to adapt that, uh, to, to use that information to uh, integrate with a chiropractic assessment of what a short leg means. Face down, looking at the short leg, bending the knees and looking at the short leg, having the person face up and looking at a short leg, and seeing what changes when they turn their head, which is called a cervical syndrome in chiropractic. These are things that are very, very useful, so please get a thorough chiropractic exam and a, and a palpatory exam. And if you want to get your adrenal glands and your sex hormones tested, Consider the Dutch test, which is a urine test of adrenal hormones and sex hormones for both men and women that can be measured in the urine. You basically pee on a little card and, and let the card air dry, and you do this five different times, and you collect this data of, of your urine at different times of day to catch the diurnal rhythm of cortisol. And as you do that, you let it all dry, and once the last card is dried for 24 hours, you pack them all up and mail it to the laboratory, and the Dutch lab sends you back a report. And I, I use this lab all the time. I love it. It's very important to integrate adrenal hormones with the sex hormones because it's possible that a, a, a deficiency of sex hormones or an imbalance of them could affect men and women and, and really any, any gender and any, any persuasion um, uh, at all. So it's very important to test your hormones and see where you stand with regard to not just the major hormones, testosterone and estrogen, but all the sub-hormones like E1, E2, and E3, you know, est estrone, estriol, and estradiol, as well as the metabolites like 5-hydroxytestosterone and androstenedione. There's other chemicals which I won't name and go through right now, but it's, it's really vital for you to look at that. And I think make sure, too, that if you're depressed that you're getting enough salt. Sometimes it's, it's a simple salt deficiency. A person is, is eating more meat and they're just not getting enough salt and they're, they're constipated, and they're depressed, and, and, and they just don't get good sleep. And it's, it's very useful to look at their salt levels and make sure they check their blood pressure and work with their doctor if they've got a high blood pressure problem to, to go on uh, diets that will help normalize their heart function and, um, and, and work with that. I have also seen patients with 
very high calcium scores in their heart, and that has made some people depressed. And it's very strange, but it seems like in some people, not all people, but in some people that get a high calcium score and have lots of placking in their arteries, they're depressed. And I don't know exactly how that works. There is an electrical field to the heart, there's blood flow issues, there's all kinds of esoteric things that I don't understand. But I will say that, you know, just because we don't know something in science doesn't mean we're idiots and we can't act. Uh, get a calcium score from a CT scanner, it's very inexpensive these days, and find out if your calcium score is good or bad, and find out if you need to change your diet to reduce your calcium score and the placking of your arteries, because that can even lead to depression. Food allergies are useful, and you've got to look for food allergies and food sensitivities, and you might need to try an elimination diet of several types. There are a number of different foods that can be very healthy foods, but they've got things in them like oxalates or histamine or some other type of thing that might trigger your depression and your brain sensitivity. Because immune reactions to food and to pollen, like tree pollen and other pollens and grasses and ragweed, can give a person depression or anxiety. So thank you for listening. That's uh, tips and tricks for depression.